Tim. So, thank you, everyone, for joining us on this beautiful day in Alberta's capital city. I am thrilled to be with so many of our provincial and municipal leaders. In particular, I want to thank the, the Honorable Jason Kenney, Premier of Alberta, for joining us for this important announcement for our municipalities. I also want to acknowledge many of the, uh, the other dignitaries in attendance this afternoon. My friend and colleague, the Honorable Rick McIver, Alberta's Transportation Minister, the Mayor of our great city, His Worship Don Iverson, joining us by teleconference, the Mayor of Calgary, His Worship Nahid Nanshi, who I know has a busy day of council meetings underway. So I thank him for making this time to participate. Also with us is the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association Vice President Tanya Ton. I know President Morshida wanted to be here today, but he is on a northern tour right now. So we wish him all the best with AUMA Northern Alberta members. And last but certainly not the least, we have the president of the rural municipalities of Alberta, our camera, who had to adjust his schedule to join us. So thank you all for your presence. I want to thank all of our dignitaries who do so much for their members and our residents across this beautiful province. And while I know that we all have multiple and competing priorities, we all care deeply about Alberta and its communities. And we are all focused on our people, our jobs, and the economic recovery of our province. The COVID-19 pandemic has presented unprecedented challenges for our province, including our municipalities who are often on the front lines of many of this impact. Your Alberta government, led by the Premier, has undertaken monumental effort and investments to ensure Alberta families, communities, and businesses can weather the storm this pandemic has presented, the likes of which we have never seen before in our lifetime. We have heard loud and clear the concerns of our municipalities, thanks in no small part to the effort of our municipal leaders present this afternoon. We know time is of the essence, and we are ready to act to ensure municipalities across our great province remain strong, viable, and viable through this pandemic and beyond. Today, we have gathered to address our response to the concerns of our municipalities, their representatives, and their respective associations. I do want to thank them once again for their leadership. And with that, I will now turn the microphone over to Premier Kenny, who will provide more details on the Alberta government historic investment to support Alberta's municipalities and this pandemic. Premier. Thanks very much, uh, Casey. What a beautiful day to be here in Edmonton. As you know, we're just wrapping up the session of the legislature, sitting all around the clock, but uh, here for a very exciting announcement about Alberta's recovery plan to get people back to work and to prepare our economy for the future. Uh, I am pleased to be here for a major announcement about uh, stimulating Alberta's economic recovery by creating jobs through unprecedented investment in our municipalities and civic infrastructure while helping local governments to cope with the COVID crisis. That crisis has been a triple threat for Alberta. First of all, it's been the largest public health crisis in over a century. Secondly, the global coronavirus recession is the largest economic contraction in the world since the 1930s. And we've also gone through the biggest collapse in energy prices in our history, obviously hurting Alberta. This has left us with a real unemployment rate, we estimate, of a north of 20%, with hundreds of thousands of families and businesses unable to pay their bills or deeply anxious about what the future holds. It also means that Alberta's local governments that do so much to deliver important services are facing a financial crisis of their own. 
From day one of the pandemic, I've said that Alberta must protect both lives and livelihoods. And that's why Alberta has been the first province to launch a detailed recovery strategy for the economy to recover from the COVID crisis. Alberta's recovery plan is a strategy to build, to diversify, and to create jobs. It involves the largest building program in the history of our province, the largest per capita across the country, a $10 billion commitment to build infrastructure uh, this year in an effort that we estimate will create some 55,000 uh, good paying jobs. In addition, uh, we are doubling down on Alberta's strategy to make this the most attractive place in North America in which to do new job creating investments, in part with the job creation tax cut that was accelerated, the red tape reduction strategy, uh, and a series of strategies to uh, accelerate the diversification of our economy, including in areas like tech and innovation, through the new innovation uh, employment grant that we announced last week. A and much more will follow. But today we are announcing another major part of Alberta's recovery plan. I am pleased to announce that provincial taxpayers will provide municipalities with more than $1.1 billion to build core and infrastructure Help lo and help local governments cope with the COVID crisis while creating thousands of good paying jobs right now. The $1.1 billion includes half a billion dollars that Alberta's government uh, is, has already committed in our recovery plan to get hundreds of shovel ready infrastructure projects underway and thousands of Albertans working on them starting right now uh, in, under the recovery plan. The other $600 million comes from our new partnership with the national government under the Safe Restart Agreement, which will help municipalities maintain public services as they work through the pandemic. The Safe Restart Agreement will see the province match $233 million in federal funding to support municipal operating costs and $70 million uh, that we will match to support public transit operating uh, during uh, this crisis as those revenues have collapsed. It's estimated that Alberta's half a billion dollar municipal stimulus program, which boosts municipal infrastructure funding by about 30%, will create 2,500 good paying jobs this year and next. Municipalities and Métis settlements may immediately begin applying for funding to build roads, bridges, water and wastewater treatment plants, and other important infrastructure that they can now be built this year and next. Even before the municipal stimulus program, Alberta had committed $1.85 billion in budget 2020 for municipalities, including a quarter of a billion dollars from the gas tax fund. The municipal stimulus program is part of the more than $10 billion infrastructure spending announced as part of the recovery plan. This includes uh, nearly $7 billion uh, in, cap in budget 2020 for capital spending, $980 million for uh, accelerated capital maintenance and repair of municipal infrastructure, sorry, provincial infrastructure, $200 million for the Strategic Transportation Infrastructure Program uh, and Water Infrastructure Projects, $600 million in key strategic uh, Alberta infrastructure projects, but many of those come from projects submitted and suggested by municipalities, and of course, a billion and a half dollars to build the Keystone XL pipeline, creating thousands of jobs. And that's on top of the $15 billion that Alberta's invested in the COVID-19 action plan to help to get people through the worst of the pandemic with additional health care and mental health resources, income support, tax loan and utility deferrals, the small business restart grants, support for homeless shelters and food banks and much more. I know when you think about these big numbers, they are eye popping. They represent a lot of borrowed money. The finance minister will provide a fiscal update about a month from now. And the provincial deficit for this year is expected to come in at more than $20 billion. So let's remember that today's deficits are tomorrow's taxes. And as I've said before, 
all of this will lead to a great fiscal reckoning. But right now, in the face of the deepest jobs crisis in nearly a century, we must uh, prudently leverage the province's balance sheet uh, to diversify and to create jobs, to build, and to ensure a strong economic future. Because if we don't get people back to work, if we don't restore investor confidence and get our economy growing again, the fiscal challenge will become insurmountable. So jobs and the economy must come first. And the best way to help pay for all of this and to get back on top of the deficit will be to get our economy growing again. That includes redoubling our efforts to cut uh, job-killing regulation and red tape, and reducing taxes to make Alberta the best place in North America to start a business. It means getting pipelines built and becoming the global supplier of choice for responsibly produced energy. It means supporting the diversification of our economy across a wide spectrum of new and existing sectors, including technology, financial technology, agribusiness, aviation, tourism, petrochemicals, and much more. It means building the core economic infrastructure now, creating jobs now, and strengthening our municipalities now as a bridge to our future private sector-led growth and prosperity. Thank you to everyone who has worked so hard to get us to the hopeful, future-focused place we are today. That includes uh, the Government of Canada and our municipal partners. I'd like to thank uh, both the AUMA and the RMA um, and in particular, thank uh, Mayors Iveson and Nenshi, with, with whom I've worked closely over the past five tough months. Through these partnerships, we are creating thousands of good jobs for Albertans by building schools, roads, and other core infrastructure that will pay dividends for generations to come. The public infrastructure you see everywhere in this great city is a testament to the foresight of generations that came before us. So let's be inspired by their example and support Alberta's COVID-ravaged economy today with these job-creating investments for a better tomorrow. With that, I will uh, invite uh, Transportation Minister McIver to say a few words. Thank you, Premier. It's uh, certainly a pleasure for me to be here today. And, and as you heard, the Premier spoke about the uh, multiple challenges uh, and, that Alberta is facing right now, including the COVID uh, pandemic and the collapse in oil prices, uh, contributing heavily to the, the uh, economic collapse uh, in uh, many segments of our economy right now. So in light of this, Alberta's government has launched a bold, ambitious, long-term recovery plan to diversify our economy for the future while creating tens of thousands of jobs right now. We know the economic development is strongly linked to our ability to move goods and people quickly and efficiently. This is why investment in transportation infrastructure, new and improved roads and bridges matters a great deal to Albertans and why it matters to Alberta's government. In transportation, we like to think about networks, how we can improve access to resources, markets, towns and cities and provide a good quality of life for those people that live in, in the municipalities and in the province. And today's announcement provides key funding for our municipal partners to improve and expand their own networks and the interaction of those networks with the provincial system. We have lots of experience with smaller municipalities in the road, bridge and water needs. Transportation's grant program, STIP, and the Alberta Municipal Water Wastewater Program are very popular and oversubscribed every single year. These grants increase the capacity of municipalities to support economic growth, improve safety and efficiency, improve accessibility and movement of goods and people and extend the service life of key infrastructure. I'm pleased and excited to work with Alberta Municipal Affairs for our larger municipal partners that generally aren't eligible under some of the other grants and programs to get them the stimulus funding that they need to build necessary projects now. As well, the Alberta government will match $70 million in federal funding for a total of $140 million to support public transit operating costs. Alberta's larger municipalities and transit agencies face uncertain uh, and financial hardship in the time of pandemic with dramatically reduced ridership and as a result, a lot less fare box revenue. The $140 million will help support transit agencies and keep them running to provide the services that Albertans need including those that don't have their own vehicles to get to and from their places of work and the other uh, 
other shopping and other things they need to do. Now, Alberta's government is focused on smart infrastructure investment that helps create jobs now and uh, to uh, set us up for uh, future recovery. Alberta Transportation strongly uh, supports the stimulus funding we're announcing today because it means real improvement in the quality of life for everyday Albertans. And it's also a key investment in the long-term commitment and long-term health of the economy and the quality of life across Alberta. And now it is my pleasure to invite uh, Mayor Don Iveson to say a few words. Your Worship. Well, thank you, Ministers, and uh, thank you, Premier, for today's announcement and reaching this important milestone. I challenge anyone to find a better backdrop for an announcement like this, so welcome, everyone. Uh, it's taken a few months for us to get here, and I would like to take the opportunity to, of course, thank Premier Kenny and the whole Alberta government for working together with the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister and the federal government to get this deal done, as it provides municipalities with some much-needed financial relief. Both as Edmonton's mayor and also as chair of Canada's Big City Mayor's Caucus, I, along with Mayor Nenshi, along with Al Kemery and Barry Morishita and everyone at RMA and AUMA, have worked very, very hard to sound the alarm regarding the serious financial realities that cities, towns and counties have been facing as a result of COVID-19 these past months. The city of Edmonton, like many municipalities across this country, has faced significant non-recoverable operational losses related to delivering and continuing to deliver essential services during this pandemic, chief among them transit, but also waste, emergency services, enforcement, other frontline and essential services. We've seen rising costs and plummeting revenues. And the total financial impact for Edmonton alone is estimated to be $172 million by the end of 2020. But very early on in Alberta and, and across the province and across the country, in this crisis, we work to offset the challenges of lost revenue and additional costs with deep and difficult decisions around service level cuts, as well as heartbreaking widespread layoffs. A difficult decision that my city council colleagues and our city administration uh, undertook. Now those layoffs are, are temporary and we still face tough decisions in the coming months and years because we don't yet know when this pandemic will end. We don't know how many waves of COVID-19 we may need to endure. And we still have work to do to reimagine our service levels amidst starker fiscal realities. Indeed, the virus remains a clear and present danger, even on a beautiful day like today. And to that end, I have called my City Council colleagues back from their summer recess to consider a face covering bylaw tomorrow that will be key to ensuring our now rising infection numbers are reversed and reverse this downward trend in order to protect our economy and human life. Last week, the City of Edmonton announced that effective August 1st, face coverings or masks must be worn in city-owned facilities and buildings and services, including transit, and hopefully by tomorrow we'll have a bylaw to back that up. But this is part and parcel of why we're grateful that this funding announcement today uh, is upon us, which will enable us to keep these essential services that Edmontonians depend on running. The enhanced cleaning, our buses have never been cleaner. Um, and also give us a confident financial position going forward to make continued difficult decisions as we grapple together with this virus. But ultimately for me, this relief announcement is a validation of what mayors have been saying for months, that economic recovery itself is at risk in our communities without financial support for municipalities and that a quick and complete recovery for our province depends immensely on the ability of our cities and our towns and our counties to recover confidently and continue, especially in the big cities, to provide services like transit at service levels that reduce crowding. So, Premier, Ministers, thank you for listening clearly to our call that the transit relief needed to primarily be directed at Edmonton and Calgary. Certainly other transit systems have been affected, but in the largest cities in this province and across the country, uh, the largest systems have borne the most significant losses. And so, uh, the success and health of our transit system is key to our economic recovery, key to keeping the workforce healthy, key to keeping Edmontonians healthy in our city. 
so that they can get to their workplaces, get to medical appointments, get to family obligations, and so much of the other essential life journeys that people who require transit depend on. And as per the release that just went out from the city today, we are planning and now are in a confident financial position to resume uh, something uh, resembling full daily weekday service as of August 30th, just in time for back to school. So finally, this milestone intergovernmental funding agreement continues the crucial conversations across our country that we all need to have in, a, in advance of a possible second wave of COVID-19. There's still a path to building a stronger country and a stronger province and stronger communities out of this pandemic. But that is, just like this did, going to require unprecedented collaboration among orders of government, even more open and frank and direct conversations with provincial, federal, and local leaders working together on behalf of the people we jointly serve. And I, I would hope that we'll be able to expect that going forward. And perhaps on that note and whatever else he has to add, I'm happy to um, offer the podium now virtually to my colleague Mayor Nenshi in Calgary. I don't know if you can see me, Nahid. I am wearing a purple tie to uh, welcome you virtually to today's event. So take it away, Mayor Nenshi. Well, thanks very much, Don. Uh, I can only see you on a Facebook stream, but thank you all uh, for allowing me to join in on today's uh, really historic announcement. Uh, as you heard, I am in the midst of a uh, council meeting, uh, our last council meeting before our summer break, uh, but I'm really happy to be able to be part of this because, you know, there have been very few great days uh, in the last five months, but today, I think, is indeed a great day. It shows that even as we're facing this global pandemic, even as we're facing the incredible hardship on Alberta citizens and businesses, we're getting through it like we always get through things, and that is together. Now, this is tough. I've always been very proud that uh, as the city, Calgary, doesn't require operating budget support, that we manage our own budget, and that we do it together every single year. But this pandemic has changed the delivery of services like never before. Nobody in Calgary wants to see us run a huge deficit and then have to make that up in the following year or years with untenable increases in the unfair regressive property tax or with massive cuts to services at a time when the economy needs them the most. And I'm really so pleased that this conversation that mayors have been having is a conversation that has resonated with provincial premiers as well as with the federal government. It's why mayors across the country have sounded the alarm that we all need support. So similar to Mayor Iveson, we have had it tough. We made the heartbreaking decision of laying off nearly 15% of our colleagues at the city. We canceled a number of transit routes. Uh, our sea train ridership at its nadir was as low as 90% lower than it normally would be. And even with all of those measures, even with all of those cuts, we are looking at a deficit at the end of this year that could approach $400 million. And this is not uncommon. Cities across the country, especially large cities, are facing uh, this kind of work. I know that citizens are, many, many citizens are in very difficult times. If you're lucky enough to still be working, you're concerned about what's going to happen in the fall. We're all concerned about the increasing numbers uh, of infection. We're concerned about the second wave. But today's announcement really helps us be able to continue to deliver the services that we need and to build infrastructure that people really require to create jobs to keep our economy moving. we got a long list of projects in Calgary, and we're excited to get to work on all of that. But I do want to say that I'm also deeply grateful. I'm deeply grateful to my fellow mayors across the country for never letting this down and to Mayor Don Iveson as our leader, as the leader of the Canadian Big City Mayors Caucus, for never letting up the pressure on the government of Canada. I'm grateful to the government of Canada, particularly through the Deputy Prime Minister's office, but also the Minister of Infrastructure and many others for being champions of cities around the federal government table that they are, haven't always been. And I'm grateful to the provincial premiers for understanding this. And I'm also grateful to Premier Kenny, uh, who by all accounts has really been a leader banging his fist around the premier's table, saying that municipalities have to be part 
of the restart program. This pandemic has been terrible. It has been terrible for so many of us and it's been terrible and it will be terrible in ways that we haven't even realized. But today's announcement gives citizens the confidence that the three orders of government are working together because we get through this the way we always get through things, and that is together. So thank you for a good day today. Looks like you are in a much nicer backdrop than me here at a very quiet city hall in Calgary. But with that, I will pass the virtual mic to my wonderful colleague, uh, the VP of the AUMA, Councillor Tanya Thorne. Thank you, Mayor Nenshi. I can't pick a better day to get the opportunity to hang out with Premier Kennedy, Kenny, Minister Madhu, and MacGyver, and uh, your worship. So thank you for making sure the weather was awesome for today. Over the past few months, we have seen firsthand COVID-19 is putting extra pressure on existing weaknesses in the municipal finance system, a finance model, property tax deferrals, free transit services and suspended rec centre operations have caused significant shortfalls in municipal revenues, making it extremely difficult for local governments to maintain services that our residents have come to expect. At the same time, municipalities have stepped up to provide the critical supports Albertans expect to help their communities respond during this ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Municipalities have responded quickly and effectively despite limited revenue options and strict limits on the amount of money they can borrow. This has stretched resources to the limit and caused significant financial uncertainty for the future, which is why we're extremely grateful to be here for the announcement that the $300 million the government of Alberta is matching to the government of Canada's $300 million to help maintain to help municipalities maintain the critical services Albertans are relying on every day. Since municipalities do not have the option to run a deficit, any revenue shortfalls have to be offset by either significant property tax increases or major service level reductions. We have already seen municipalities laying off employees and cutting back their staffing levels to preserve their finances as best they can. Those are jobs that help keep our communities healthy and vibrant. There cannot be a full recovery without strong municipalities. We need municipalities to lead recovery efforts on the ground and do that, they need to be able to rehire their employees. These funds will help local governments to continue to deliver clean water to your homes, keep transit systems running, provide firefighters and police officers so they're on standby, and social services operating for those individuals and families who are at risk of falling through the cracks. Public transit is the backbone of livable, competitive and sustainable cities. The $140 million dedicated to transit is crucial for maintaining existing levels of service in the communities that provide public transportation. AUMA is delighted to see that the previously announced $500 million in capital stimulus funds is being allocated to all, municipality, all Alberta municipalities, bringing back jobs and building vital infrastructure in our communities. AUMA has always maintained that an economic recovery can only happen if there is an, an investment in Alberta's communities. This is a fantastic first step to building a stronger Alberta Rebuild, by rebuilding its strong communities. I'd like to join my colleagues in thanking and giving my accommodations to our provincial government for stepping up and making this decision to invest in municipalities. So thank you again. I would like to now welcome Al Camry, the President of Rural Municipalities of Alberta. Well, thank you, Tanya, and thank you, Premier and Ministers, I'm Madhu and and MacGyver for uh, allowing us to be here and, and celebrate in this partnership. Uh, a little bit of background, the rural municipalities of Alberta, we represent all the counties and municipal districts in the province and through our membership we provide the services of, of 175,000 kilometers of road and over 8,800 bridges. And so you can only imagine how important this is to us to have this kind of support. But this is what partnerships are all about. 
This is a partnership between our provincial government recognizing how they can help our rural municipalities or all municipalities come through the COVID-19 challenges and move our way forward and find the jobs that we can, we can benefit from in all, in all levels. This is the province recognizing that in order to make the, to have the, the funding move from the federal government into the hands of the municipalities, they will do their part. So again, another great example of partnerships. And partnerships is what makes municipalities work together. A great example is um, Barry Morishita from AUMA, Don Ivis and myself, and Mary Nenshi. We all sit on the West Committee, which is the Western Economic Solutions Task Force. And that is about partnerships and trying to make sure that the West um, the issues in the West are, are, well, are well identified and so Don and I spend many hours on the phone talking through the FCM work and through the West, the West work, but it's all about partnerships. So as we move forward on this, I think so many of the, the important items regarding COVID have been touched, so I won't, I won't go into that too much, but it has had a tremendous impact on all municipalities in the province, whether it's layoffs, whether it's jobs and the, and the people that we represent and the people that that um, look after our services, the jobs that they have lost or they've been put on hold. Now with this kind of funding, we can move forward. And whatever the distribution model does look like in the future, I know it will recognize the, the various differences within the municipalities and the needs to deal with the municipal needs that we all can, re can represent. So again, thank you, Mr. Premier, for, um, for your work and for your leadership in this. This has been uh, an event that none of us could ever imagine and it will go down in history. So thank you for the leadership. Thank you to the ministers for, um, for their constant vigilance of keeping us involved in, in the process because it would be so much easier to, to slide us to the side. But they've, they've taken that effort to make sure we're engaged. I know we're not done and um, we've got some significant challenges and we better get used to wearing these because it's our best tool to look after our people in the future. So um, thank you again for all the effort and um, we look forward to future partnerships um, much like this with the, both the province and, and our, our, our fellow municipalities. So thank you and I'll turn it over to Mitch. Okay, before we get the media Q&A started, I'd like to remind the media on the line to please let us know who you're directing your question to. Operator, can you please put through the first caller? Our first question comes from Chris Varco of the Calgary Herald. Your line is open. Hi, this is a question for the Premier. Uh, Premier, yesterday Deutsche Bank uh, announced that they will no longer finance any projects in the oil sands. They grow part of a, a growing list of banks and sovereign wealth funds that are now doing so. Are you concerned about the impact of, that these prohibitions are having on the ability of the oil sands industry to raise financing that is needed to grow? And I guess more importantly, how are you going to reverse this trend as it picks up steam because the current strategy does not appear to be working? Well, yes, of course we're concerned. The access to capital has pre-COVID been become one of the biggest challenges of Canada's energy industry. And much of that, as I've said before, coming out of a misinformed campaign uh, from European financial institutions, which have wrongly uh, uh, judged uh, Cana the Canadian oil sands as being the environmental equivalent of thermal coal that is r uh, ridiculous and unscientific. Uh, but it's part of a highly coordinated campaign uh, that's frankly a decade long. Now, uh, I will tell you that, that we, have, we have had some successes in our effort to, uh, to push back and tell the truth. Uh, there are at least three major global banks uh, with whom I have worked over the, past, uh, over the past year, all of them based in Europe, which were under pressure to adopt similar policies, but which did not do so. Uh, because we got in front of them and made the the factual case about uh, the tremendous environmental improvements in the Canadian oil sands. You know, uh, as soon as we raise with these companies, the fact that their policy means that they will uh, finance uh, the oil uh, industry in Saudi Arabia or in Vladimir Putin's Russia or in Maduro's Venezuela, as soon as we point out that Canada is the third most highly ranked country on uh, global ESG metrics for oil and gas, as soon as we point out that Alberta companies like Suncor, Sonovas, NRL, Meg, uh, and so many others are in the top ranked metrics of ESG, 
and they are in fact financing the worst ranked companies like Saudi Aramco, PetroChina and Gazprom. As soon as we get a, a chance to point these things out, we see that we, we've had an impact. But this is a campaign, as I say, that's been going on for a decade. Uh, believe me, we will be, uh, first of all, we will be demanding that uh, Deutsche Bank share with us the factual basis upon which these decisions were made. Uh, because uh, we don't believe the decisions were made in the interest of their shareholders and certainly not in terms of the global economy. Uh, so we will engage with that and other financial institutions as we continue to do. Look, in the past four or five months, our uh, advocacy strategy has obviously been like so much else, sidetracked by COVID, uh, but we will absolutely get re-engaged um, with those European financial institutions. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Our next question comes from Emma Graney of the Global Mail. Your line is open. Yeah, g'day. Uh, this is a similar question, actually, following up on what uh, Chris was just asking now on the oil stand. Um, a, Deutsche Bank don't have to tell you anything, so how are you planning on uh, doing that? But B, um, CAP has been speaking a lot today about how the federal programs for oil and gas aren't actually working because they're too prescriptive and companies aren't actually able to access uh, funding. So uh, you had said that the province was going to look at liquidity support measures. Are you doing that still, and um, where is that looking right now? On the first question, uh, they've made a commercially sensitive decision as a publicly traded company that operates in Canada uh, that is uh, subject to Canadian regulations. They've made a commercially sensitive decision, uh, and we want to know uh, if that is uh, on what data that was based as the first step we typically take. Uh, when a foreign financial institution makes a decision like this uh, is to uh, ask for that data and uh, to hold them accountable uh, because very typically they're uh, lumping in the Canadian oil sands because they've seen that on a brochure from a series of green pressure groups in Europe. They typically don't even know that when they uh, talk about oil sands they're essentially talking about 95 percent of the oil production in Canada and that Canada is the only country in the world with a substantial active oil, oil sands reservoir. So there are basic facts of which they're not aware, and that's why we uh, ask them and have done in the past. And by the way, I'll, I'll let you know, Emma, that there have been, uh, we, as I've said to, in response to Chris, we have had success in, uh, in preventing these kinds of decisions from being made exactly by taking this assertive approach. On the issue of uh, access to capital in the COVID crisis, um, I um, had meetings on Saturday evening with uh, leaders in the industry in Calgary, and uh, my sense right now is that at the current uh, price, which is roughly, it's been averaging $42 WTI, $33 WCS in the past two or three weeks, that, that most of our producers are uh, able to survive the, this crisis at that price point. Um, as you know, uh, a production break-in for most of the, uh, sorry, pr production break-even price point for most of the oil sands producers is about $30, and all-in break-even, including cost of capital, is about $40. Um, we continue to work with the industry associations and the Government of Canada to uh, improve the uh, credit to facilities that the Government of Canada has put out there. Unfortunately, my, the, I continue to receive reports that they've largely been inaccessible. But let me put it this way. We have made it clear, Emma, that, that we are prepared uh, to step in uh, as a last resort to ensure a future for our largest industry, which is responsible for half a million Canadian jobs, should it be strictly necessary. Uh, and uh, we have not received calls from either uh, individual companies nor from industry associations uh, to extend that kind of support. So we continue to monitor it very closely, uh, but right now we are cautiously optimistic that at the current price point, as recovery return, growth returns to the global economy, inventories come down, there will be a supply shortage in uh, the next 12 to 18 months, which will be expressed through a much higher price. And that's a, that represents a path to the future for Alberta's largest industry. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Our next question comes from Vinesh Partap of Global News. Her line is open. Hi, yes, this is a question for uh, Mayor Don Iveson. Uh So, Mayor, are you able to uh, just do a breakdown on what the city uh, will receive from this contribution from the pro province and the feds? And then with that, what does this mean for future budget conversations uh, down the road? Will they be as dire as earlier predicted? 
So um, thanks for the question, Vinesh. Um, the transit dollars of the 140 million, we understand 60 will come to us. Now that's for go forward. So we won't be able to use that for uh, retroactive uh, costs and transit was our area of most significant loss. However, the general funds that are coming to all municipalities on a, um, on an apportioned and equitable basis uh, is closer to 100 million. I don't have the number in front of me, um, but we'll get that for you offline, certainly. But that that uh, larger uh, pot of funds is able to be used uh, retroactively, we understand, in order to deal with some of the extraordinary costs we've already incurred for cleaning, for PPE, for staff, uh, as well as some of the impairments we've taken on everything from uh, parking revenue to uh, transit fare box revenue, and even reintroducing uh, charging fares on June uh, 15th. Uh, you know, when ridership's at 20 percent, that uh, moves your whole from 100 percent of what's in your budget to 80 percent of what's in your budget. And we wanted to make sure we could collect fares safely uh, for the public and for the operators. So it'll help us stem some of those uh, uh, challenges. Ridership's back up to about half of what we would normally expect at this time of year. So there are continuing um, uh, gaps in our budget going forward and these funds will help both with the retroactive and the go forward. And I'm sorry I don't have the exact number for the, uh, Cheryl, do you have that number? 116 is the uh, non-transit portion plus 60 in the transit portion. So, uh, but we'll verify that and get, get back to you. Thanks, Vinesh. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? The next question comes from Kevin Nimick of CTV. Your line is open. Hi there. This is a question for the Premier. Uh, while unveiling the plan for school in the fall, you said in-class lessons were possible because of the success of the summer school program. So the Calgary Catholic School Division just confirmed that a student attending summer school has tested positive for COVID-19. How can you justify going forward with in-class education in the fall if it's not even safe for summer students attending classes with strict student limits and spacing requirements? Well, first of all, what I was referring to a dry run that the Calgary Catholic system had with summer school. They had uh, a, uh, I think, a staff member who was symptomatic. Uh, they went through all the protocols uh, and uh, that were pro properly followed, and uh, fortunately, that person tested negative. Uh, you know, I've been clear, as was Dr. Hinshaw, when we announced our intention for a safe reopening of the schools, uh, that there will be positive cases with uh, three quarters of a million students and uh, tens of thousands of teachers and staff. Uh, it's inevitable that there will be some cases. When we look to jurisdictions like, for example, Taiwan and South Korea, very densely populated uh, countries with uh, who have continued to operate their schools without uh, limitations o over the past five months. We've seen no significant outbreaks, and that's generally been the case across jurisdictions that either maintained uh, their schools or reopened them. Uh, the Safe School Reopening Program was designed in careful consultation with the Chief Medical Officer for Health, Dr. Hinshaw, with uh, Alberta Health, Alberta Health Services, with superintendents, school boards, uh, parents' councils, and others. Uh, and a very clear guidelines have been provided to the school. So uh, the reality is simply this. As long as uh, COVID is a reality, uh, there are going to be infections. Uh, there will be uh, infections, the challenge for us is to ensure that those infections don't reach a peak which overwhelms our healthcare system. And on that ground, we've done extremely well as a province. Even today, with the recent uh, increase in cases, we are at a fraction of where our uh, best case scenario was in the models we released uh, in April. I would also reiterate the evidence from, um, in, in terms of the impact of, of COVID-19 on uh, younger people is the younger you go, the, the less impactful it is. Uh, in fact, my understanding is that uh, since uh, the pandemic started in Canada five months ago, uh, we've seen only one fatality of anybody under the age of 20. And I don't believe any fatalities under the age of 72 in Alberta since, uh, I believe since uh, April. So. Um, the uh, the chances of, of children uh, uh, becoming negatively affected by the virus are not non-existent, but they are uh, uh, they are very small statistically, which is, I believe, one of the reasons why our public health officials have given us the green light to proceed with the opening of the schools. Okay, we have time for three more. Operator, can you put through the next caller, please? The next question comes from James Keller of the Global Mail. Your line is open. 
Uh, this is a question for the Premier and also probably Mayor Nancy. Where are we at with provincial funding and support for the Green Line? And, uh, and why wouldn't this be kind of the right time to start moving ahead on that, given the sort of effort to well, use infrastructure I guess uh, as I'll, part of the recovery? I'll, I'll go first. Uh, the, as you know, City Council approved a uh, proposal for the Green Line, I think about three weeks ago, that was significantly uh, different from the original proposed version in 2015 and su substantially different from the uh, version that the province uh, authorized uh, funding for a couple of years back. So well, we have to do our due diligence. Uh, no government should simply write a blank check. We all have to do our due diligence. We're all accountable to our taxpayers. That's why we've engaged an expert outside uh, infrastructure consultant to assess the latest uh, version of the Calgary LRT Green Line. Uh, and to provide advice on what might be risk points, um, on the financing structure, and a number of other issues. We've been clear that uh, we support the Green Line in principle, but we have to do this due diligence, and we appreciate the cooperation of Calgary in doing so. Is Mayor Nenshi on the line? I am. Uh, thanks so much uh, for that question. Um, I will point out uh, just real quickly that, in fact, what Council approved um, uh, in a 14 to 1 vote a few weeks ago, is fundamentally the same as what was approved um, by the previous provincial government. Uh, the only difference is that the tunnel under the Bow River is a bridge now, and that the alignment in the belt line is one block south of where we had thought of it before. That said, uh, as I said before, it's a very big investment on the part of the provincial government, and it makes total sense for the provincial government to. Uh, do its due diligence to figure out what it wants to do. And as I've said uh, before, if there is an opportunity to put some more money into it or to think about it in a way where we can reduce financing costs uh, or reduce risk, we are absolutely very open to having that conversation. Uh, and we just hope that it is expeditious uh, that we move forward. We've been fully cooperating with the provincial government with all of our data, uh, and we look forward to continuing those conversations to find a win-win. I will point out that uh, as per council direction, the request for proposal for construction of phase one was released to the market on Friday. We're getting very good uh, market uh, interest in that, though if the result of the provincial government's analysis is that we want to do a different procurement strategy, that's just fine, uh, and we will be able to do so, and we've been very transparent about that. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? question comes from Graham Thompson of iPolitics. Your line is open. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Premier Kenny and Mayor Iveson. You've talked about, of course, getting the economy going again. COVID is still a problem. Uh, it's going to rise in um, cases. Is it time to have a province-wide ban on masks? I asked because, of course, last week Mayor Iveson said the decision for mandatory masks would be best be made as a province-wide decision as opposed to downloading it on the civic government. So what do you say to that, Premier Kenny and Mayor Iverson? Well, first of all, I say that we strongly encourage people to wear masks where they cannot physically distance, particularly in indoor environments. Uh, it is uh, just a sign of a care for others to do so. And I'll remind you, Graham, that uh, when the Public Health Agency of Canada and the World Health Organization were strongly recommending against widespread mask use, uh, I was criticized for strongly recommending widespread mask use. And we've more than just recommended it. We're the only government in Canada that has facilitated it in a real practical way by providing uh, over 40 million free uh, uh, procedure masks to Albertans, including millions to the cities uh, uh, for their transit riders, for example, free of cost, free of charge. So uh, as Dr. Hinshaw said from the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we can't enforce our way out of this. While we strongly encourage uh, the use of masks and totally respect uh, the municipalities who may decide to uh, mandate mask usage, for example, in mass transit, it makes perfect sense to me if you're required to wear a mask on an airplane. Uh, where you're in close quarters with other people, it seems perfectly sensible that you should be required to do so on a bus or a LRT. But uh, on a province-wide basis, as I say, our, our general approach is one of encouragement and education, uh, rather than uh, to get into all the problems of enforcement. And secondly, this is a very, very big and diverse province. And what makes a lot of sense on a crowded bus in downtown Calgary may not make the same sense uh, in a barn in a remote community in northern Alberta uh, 
approximate to which there are no active cases. So I, I think that a, a kind of a, applying the, the logic of, of a crowded bus in a downtown core to uh, far-flung rural areas that are um, sparsely populated and have no active cases would, would actually, I think, be counterproductive in terms of social acceptance of mask wearing. So um, we, again, we accept the, the um, decisions that cities will make in this respect, and I certainly think it makes a lot of sense on transit. With that, Don? Well, thanks for the question, Graham. Um, I think it's important to put this issue in at least a metropolitan context uh, because I understand that the need may be, let me take these off, that the, uh, uh, that the need may be different in uh, rural parts of our province far from the population centers than in the cities. So I respect that one size fits all in Alberta um, perhaps might not be supported by uh, the evidence in terms of active case count. The problem is that the testing results and the case counts are all lagging indicators. So by the time you know you have a problem, which is tended to show up uh, first in urban areas, um, it's, it's too late uh, or you can only take reactive action. Uh, and, and I think at this point there is uh, a fairly clear and persuasive evidence that uh, masks do help both reduce the spread uh, of the virus uh, from people to each other uh, and also reduce the viral load uh, according to the theory of viral inoculum. And so certainly where uh, social distancing cannot be maintained, which is obviously easier to do in the country than it is uh, on, on an LRT vehicle, but quite frankly, uh, in, a, in a busy suburban grocery store, whether it's in St. Albert or whether it's in Edmonton, it's one metropolitan economy. Uh, it's one labor market. It's one commuter shed. And the challenge is for the city of Edmonton to have to make this decision just for the city of Edmonton uh, leaves open the possibility that uh, a neighboring municipality might take a different measure, which could in the short term be bad for businesses in our city. And our Chamber of Commerce has called quite clearly for a mask mandate uh, to remove ambiguity for businesses and equip them uh, to, to, um, to maintain a stronger barrier of safety for their own workforce and for the continuity of their business, which we know is critical to our economic recovery. And so uh, I still believe that at least at a metropolitan scale, um, this, should, this decision should be taken. I also think this is a public health measure, not a community standards measure. And public health is, uh, we're all becoming sort of amateur public health experts here, but unlike municipalities in Ontario, municipalities in Alberta don't explicitly have that mandate and we don't explicitly have that expertise. That said, if it falls to us, we will make that. Uh, we'll make a decision tomorrow. I, I don't know where the votes will land, but it sounded from the debate the other day like there was widespread council support based on widespread community support, based on uh, widespread business support. And I hope that um, we won't wind up with a situation where an outbreak is traced back to a suburban grocery store in one of the outlying uh, communities around us because uh, the big city took the step and the bedroom communities didn't. Um, that said, it sounds like uh, from the conversations with the mayors that they're all looking at this closely, that uh, most if not all of the transit systems will follow our direction and lead on this. Uh, so to the extent possible for clarity and consistency, uh, certainly for regions of the uh, residents of the Edmonton metropolitan region, I think a consistent approach would be best. Uh, again, I would ask, but I think we know the answer, that that, that come from Dr. Hinshaw or at least from Chris Sikora, the Zone Medical Officer of Health. Uh, but again, if it falls to cities, we'll take action to protect the economy and protect lives. Okay, we have time for one more. Operator, could you please put through the last caller? The question comes from Audrey Nouveau of Radio Canada. Your line is open. Hi, my question is for Premier Kenny. If you could please answer in English and in French, I think it could help my colleagues. Uh, this morning, uh, economist Trevor Toome published calculations that showed that for the first time in 55 years, Alberta will receive more money in federal transfers from Ottawa than it pays out. And according to him, it's mainly because of COVID-19 and the drop in oil prices. I want to know what's your reaction to this projection? Well, obviously, this is a bizarre year. We haven't seen a year like this in Alberta's fiscal history since we went broke as a province in 1935. Minister Taze will be giving a, a fiscal update to Albertans about a month from now, which is going to show a deficit well north of $20 billion. We've seen the evaporation of 
probably $14 billion in revenue this year. Uh, and have obviously had to spend billions on, on health and, and so much more to care for lives and livelihoods. Uh, and uh, at the same time, the government of Canada has been, um, has been obviously putting forward a, an enormous amount of spending on programs like the CERB, and Albertans have uh, been uh, benefited disproportionately from that, which, uh, which I've said I, I appreciate to the Prime Minister. Uh, I suspect that when we get back into anything like a normal economic cycle post-COVID, that we will continue to face the structural challenge that Alberta has within uh, the Federation for the past five decades, where it, during which time we have contributed net about $630 billion more to the Federation in, through our federal taxes than we got back in, in benefits. Um, so the fundamental issues about fairness in the Federation don't go away because of this, this strange, aberrant COVID year. Uh, we'll need to continue to address those. Uh, having said that, we do again, we do appreciate the federal support in part incorporated in the uh, Safe Restart uh, Agreement uh, and the support for municipalities that we are matching and announcing today. And I'll do the same in, in French pour dire que... Uh, uh, évidemment, c'est une année très, très étrange, uh, particulière, avec la crise de COVID-19 et uh, on a, nous voyons un déficit énorme sans précédent pour l'Alberta et uh, une diminution des revenus incroyable. Nous donnerons une mise à jour aux Albertains uh, d'ici un mois, mais c'est clair que les Albertains profitent des transferts um, pour le COVID-19 du gouvernement fédéral actuellement. Mais je crois qu'à la fin de la crise, euh, on va retourner à une situation euh, plus normale pour l'Alberta. Ça veut dire, euh, j'en suis certain qu'à l'avenir, la, les Albertains seront euh, les contributeurs nets euh, à la fédération comme nous sommes depuis 50 ans. And maybe if I'll just close in English to say uh, that... Uh, Today's announcement is, I think, an important sign of partnership, and as Mayor Nenshi said, of, uh, a, a little bit of sign of, of, of hope that we're going to get through this together. But it's also a good day for Alberta because the Flames and the Oilers are showing uh, down at, at the first exhibition game uh, for the end of the NHL season right here in Edmonton at Rogers Place. So I hope that folks are, who have this, some time tonight will tune in at 8.30 uh, to watch uh, the Battle of Alberta happening right here in, El in Edmonton. And uh, I, I just want to say thank you to Albertans for making it possible for the NHL to choose this city. Uh, it's, it was chosen for one main reason, great, well, there are lots of good reasons, but mainly because of uh, Albertans' responsibility during the pandemic. Uh, we've been the best, this has been the best performing city in the NHL. Congratulations, Mayor, to you, your, your, uh, your whole city on getting noticed uh, by the NHL, and we'll see that on the ice at Rogers Place at 8.30 tonight. So go Flames, go Oilers, whichever team you want to support. I, I'm, I'm going to stay neutral tonight. <laughs> that concludes the Q&A. Thanks very much, everyone.